Thank you. Okay. Right. So, um, um, thank you, um, Mike. And um, basically, as uh, you, as has been suggested, yeah, I'm going to talk about two things: the Marston rigging surveys, and I'm going to talk about um, artificial intelligence and give you some background there and how it relates them to the <clears throat> um, marine surveying industry and 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 kind of some of the things that you know Mike and I see um, on the horizon with respect to that. Um, I mean. So effectively, I mean, both of these are very vast subjects. So when I started with the Marston rigging surveys, I'm really going to sort of um, the, uh, define the structure and the approach to these surveys and highlight some sort of areas that um, that, that I've seen that are, are maybe not typically written about and, um, and bring those up. And then, um, of course, I will um, also present some resources uh, where people can, uh, you know, read further on on some of these things. Um, you know, I think we probably got a fairly mixed audience here. Some people will be very familiar with, um, with you know, fairly familiar with this area, and and others might might not. So, um, you know, just uh, bear with me, and I'll I'll try to to find something for everyone. Um, and uh, as Mike said, I've just really completed two handy guides: one on rigs and the other one on spars, and. Um, which are currently being being published, and the one you know, and the one on rigs looks into uh, all of the new types of rigs, including kite rigs and um, um, <clears throat> and the new type of wing masts, and um, that are being used now on, on more on sort of fast cruising vessels, uh, yachts as well, and multi hulls, and the one on spars looks at um, all of the technology around um, you know typical construction of wing masts and uh, the new type of construction of um, you know, carbon fiber masks that are being done by um, by southern spars and things like that with the uh, with really the sort of thin ply technology. Anyway, getting on to the subject here, um, in terms of rig surveys, I mean, rigs require regular surveys. And one of the, you know, kind of interesting things here is that when owners come to sell their vessels, you know, the yachts, most of them um, really typically don't understand when when the standing rigging was last replaced or, or when they actually had um, a, a rigging survey or whether you know or whether one was done prior to them purchasing the yacht or anything like that. So while regular surveys are, are very important, it seems that um, that this kind of lack of continuity and 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 owners sort of really um, having that and I think that ultimately that can also affect the um, the sale price, because at the end of the day, if you don't know these things, then there has to be an assumption that they haven't been done and that they either need to be done and standing rigging needs to be replaced. And that is already overdue. And this is also, you know, driven a lot more by really um, synthetic rigging, because with synthetic rigging, um, you know, typically the lifespan of the rigging is determined by its exposure to UV as well as other um, things like, you know, obviously fatigue loading. But, um, and, and of course, you know, whether you have you know, stainless steel wire rigging or you have um, synthetic rigging also affects the, um, the, 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 the period of um, replacement period. Um, so really here there are, um, and again, the masks of different materials, again, require different types of inspections. Uh, many uh, carbon fiber masks today are really covered, you know, by the service program of, of the manufacturer. And, and so it's not, so that's really not conducive to the, the, the typical marine surveyor actually, um, you know, do, doing a, a survey of, of, of the mask itself. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, in terms of the, uh, type of attachment of the synthetic rigging and, and things like that, it also becomes more more complicated. But um, effectively, there are um, different types of, in, you know, categories of inspection. There's the periodic, these annual and comprehensive. And we'll look at some uh, tables that, that sort of show that um, later. Um, now, and, you know, some types of, of inspections are carried uh, out with the mast in and others are best done with the mast out or removed from the yacht. Um, and of course, the most effective method is to un unstep the mast and inspect the spar um, horizontally on stands. But you know, in terms of the cost factor, that uh, depending on the on on the type of um, of inspection that's being done, uh, you know, that's not necessarily um, 
cost effective and uh, anything that would be attractive to to the owner. However, I think that um, in countries where yachts are taken out of the water during winter, um, you know, it's an ideal opportunity to have those inspections done prior to relaunching um, for for the next um, you know summer season. And, and I think there is an advantage there if things can be lined up to be done at that point, and and it can be very cost effective. So I think there's there's two things emerging from this. One is how marine surveyors can proactively work with owners for the most cost effective approach. Uh, to to when and 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 you know to when which of these types of inspections could and should be done, and then also I think that documentation is really becoming more and more important. And I'm 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 starting to think that you know repeat business marine surveyors able to assist owners with with documentation, um, and you know maybe also coming back and nudging owners that you know the you know that they really should um, have the next uh, you know rig survey uh, is is kind of due, coming due and things like that. So I'm thinking about you know possibly. Um, you know, and, and would like to understand from uh, other marine surveyors whether they do that, but, um, you know, more of a kind of proactive approach to to engaging first, um, you know, adding in term, adding capability in terms of the, the documentation, assisting with the documentation, and, um, and, and then also being more proactive. So looking at, at, at a rig survey, typically we have two parts to that. One is really the spars. And the other one is is the rigging, and um, you know, typically when we when we look at the spars, we look at the mast steps, the mast head, the hounds, the tangs, the spreaders and jumpers, and and of course the the mast section itself. Then then you know any booms and fittings um, and other types of spars that 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 there would be. Now and then we look at the at the rigging, you know, whether the rigging wires are standard steel or synthetic standing rigging. Rigging terminals that you know the the turnbuckles you know we look at wire locking split pinning and we'll look at a little bit more of that in 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 you know in in this presentation and then of course we we would obviously check things like the, the chain plates because um, the rigging could be sound but if the weakest link is the chain plates then of course we still have a problem um, and then you know some insurers um, want to see um, rigging replacement at defined intervals. Um, while others just will continue to ensure you if you have a, a rig survey. Um, and what I'm suggesting here is really that there is two distinct aspects to, uh, to, to a rig survey. Now, in terms of the spa aspects, um, you know, in, in inspections include, but not limited to, you know, fastenings, obviously correct type, correct fastener length, the attachment to the fittings, the actual spa integrity itself, you know, inspection of the hounds, any all the tangs, the masthead and the cap, the spreaders, jumpers, um, you know, vangs, um, and and the, also particularly the use of safety. In other words, um, you know, are the tangs and the hounds and and all of the other um, fittings are they in attached in such a way um, that they are actually safety? In other words, are nylock nuts being used or split pins being used? Um, you know, is um, is mousing or, or, or um, safety wiring being used? And also the, the type of things we would want to look at and report on is um, things like appropriate sizing, um, you know, potentially of the spars and the rigging. Um, and, and there are a couple of um, interesting things in um, in one of the, uh, the handy guide that's being published is there are kind of um, very simple rules of thumb that you can apply, very simple calculation you can apply to determine whether a mast or a, or a boom is is of approximately the right kind of dimension for for the craft and 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 things like that. Obviously, there's also um, for synthetic rigging. There's also a, a very simple um, calculator that I created that's that's available the way you can actually determine um, from the wire wire rigging size what the synthetic rigging size should actually be. Um, also, you're looking here for any any movement that's that's uh, you know there is in fittings, um, 
you know, obviously corrosion, you know, cracking of attachment fittings, any kind of discoloration that might indicate the use of the wrong type of, for example, you know, stainless steel um, fastener. Um, and, and again, um, a lack of safety and then anything else that is that is unusual. And then, of course, the ringing aspects, as we said, um, you know, um, all of the standard ringing wires and terminals, all the chain plates, turnbuckles, again, appropriate sizing, you know, um, displacement and movement of anything that um, that should be uh, firmly attached, um, any kind of water ingress, um, you know, you know, behind um, behind the fittings that that could again uh, result in in uh, additional corrosion or, or further corrosion, uh, damage to wire or synthetic rigging, um, you know, discoloration, of course, uh, chafe um, of of wire, but especially in the case of synthetic rigging, and also the the, the lack of um, safety of of the rigging, which is uh, again, as we said, most important. Now. And, and we'll look at some some of these these aspects as well. But then I think also the important thing is right up front is really to to understand something about the rig before you even get started. In other words, obviously you know whether it's a state or understate rig, who is the spa maker, what materials are fabricated in, um, what are the construction techniques, what what type of um, of of rig is it? Does it use you know off swept or straight spreaders? Um, what type of standing rigging is used? Um, how old is the is is the mast and other spars? When was it last unstepped for inspection, which I kind of alluded to earlier? Um, when was the rigging last replaced? And how many cruising and or, or racing miles has it done? Um, you know, since the rigging was last replaced. Um, and then I think it's very important that these, you know, at at, at a minimum these. Um, Findings and the any additional findings uh, be documented so that at least the owner can have that as a record, uh, which they can then um, use for any subsequent as a basis for any subsequent um, uh, rig surveys. Now, in terms of the inspection types, and I've and and um, the handy guide has got um, the detail for all different uh, for all different types. But here I've just used the already for the cruising yacht ones, uh, and um, you know recommended inspections. So annual inspection, of course, annually, mast in or out, visual um, by marine surveyor, competent rigger, or structural engineer, uh, record of the scope, referral of specific items, investigation, update, you know, service log, and next next service schedule. And that's kind of you know what I'm alluding to here in terms of documentation, and then. You know, a comprehensive um, inspection. Um, you know, here I would always like to see this as being five to eight years. I know that um, in a lot of cases, this quote is as ten years. Um, um, so either five to eight years or the rigging replacement interval, whichever is sooner. And and typically, um, you know, rigging replacement, in my opinion, and um, and also in the opinion of others should be really closer to the at the which is often um it's on the the operating conditions the amount of usage and guidance from spa and rigging manufacturers and in, of course ins insurance schedules or um and, you know and, or requirements override um you know in any of these um recommendations comprehensive has to be masked out uh comprehensive visual inspection um, and, um, you know, obviously by, you know, competent, you know, rigging company or structural engineer or marine surveyor, um, and again, or a competent rigger, uh, working with, uh, um, you know, uh, and, you know, with a marine surveyor to, to get that done. Um, and again, we would like to see, um, again, we would like to see the history. So we, we would like to have seen that there had been previous documentation and, and be able to um, relate the current survey to that. Um, and, and that was for aluminum mass. And once we get to, to carbon fiber mass, it, you know, we require really um, more inspection types. Um, now it's very interesting because um, a lot of the, um, the companies building um, Common fiber masts for for cruising vessels, who even though they're using um, you know autoclave cured pre-preg carbon fiber, 
um, and they can really control their manufacturing process, they would still go for safety factors of 3.5 or of that order, which is actually um, which is actually still really high if you compare that, for example, to e even to the um, you know um, aircraft industry and their and their use of, of carbon fiber. Now, you know, you would expect those kind of um, safety factors if if the Mars were built out of um, you know a hand layup, um, um, you know, room temperature cured um, resins and stuff like that. But it, it's just interesting that um, that obviously there is not there's either not a lot of confidence in in um, or that there's just not a lot of typically lot of, not a lot of knowledge as to exactly what are the repeatable um, you know material um, parameters that you can get from from their manufacturing process. So again, it, it, you know it probably is that it's easier to go for a higher safety factor. But again, it kind of defeats um, some of the advantages of the carbon fiber mast. And you know if you go um, you know, to to such a high safety factor. You know, the the problem also is that you're paying a lot more money because you actually have a lot more carbon fiber in the mast than than you might have actually needed at 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 a lower safety factor. So, what is the you know? There's a lot of debate as to what the safety factor is that that should be used. Um, maybe maybe a safety factor of 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 two max two point five would be would would be better. But anyway, these these are all um, topics for um, you know where there's a lot of lot of debate. Um, so as we said, we have their periodic every six months, and um, uh, that's a um, that's a mast in inspection uh, and visual. Um, and then we have the annual, at, uh, um, and that's also a mast in, and then a comprehensive between five to eight years, depending on the operating conditions. Now, um, a lot of carbon fiber masts, of course, also have synthetic rigging. So again, it, it is probably often um, most cost effective to align the um, you, you know the 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 the, the rigging um, new rigging being fitted at the same time that the uh, that that the mast inspection is that the rigging inspection is being done, and then um, that can be done where there's a mast out inspection of the spars, new rigging is fitted. Then the then the mast is re-stepped and um, there is an inspection that the rigging um, has been um, you know fitted correctly and, and and safety and all those those types of things. So just uh, you know as I said just a table and some information um, uh, recommended information around this. However, you know there this is can be overridden of course by manufacturers' requirements um, and um, other guidance. Now just a few things where that I wanted to just highlight in terms of of of, of rigging, um, and rigging inspections that are probably not really much written about, um, and um, one of those things is actually on um, rotating wing masts that we um, that we find, of course, on on multi hulls, and we can see here that in the picture that there is some ch chafe protection being applied to the to the edge of the mast because what happens is. When the mast rotates, so a, you know, um, a, a wing mast is always rotated up to windward to give you a smooth entry uh, onto the sail. And in doing so, the leeward um, shroud or stay actually, um, as, as, a, as the mast rotates, it comes up against the mast surface and touches that. It's not under load, but, but of course, remember that you are, you have a um, fairly stiff, terminal, for example, here, rigging terminal, and then you're constantly kind of changing the angle of that quite dramatically. And again, um, the one thing is the chafe on the spar itself. And then the other thing is that you, um, additional movement uh, obviously kind of deforms the, the wire, especially, you know, the wire and the lay of the wire, and of course adds to the fatigue um, that you that you would get over time in 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 the rigging, and so you know you probably with the rotating wing mast you would you would go for the shorter time before replacement of the rigging uh, would probably be more more prudent in um, in my in my experience. You can see here also that um, you know the um, looks like the jib halyard block here has been also been chafing 
uh, on the um, on the mast. And you'll notice that the that the wire rigging actually has some chafe, been you know, obviously plastic chafe guard or shrink um, sleeving being applied um, to reduce that. Obviously, um, we go to the next one. Um, we can see that where you use um, synthetic rigging, um, the chafe can become more of a problem. In this particular case, there is no chafe guard on, on the synthetic rigging. We would typically apply shrink sleeving uh, to take care of that. Also, um, this highlights the fact that when you start to use um, these T-ball fittings, um, you can either use a stopper uh, in above the fitting to ensure that the fitting can't uh, and, uh, you know, um, come loose. Because remember that when we operate um, the rigging on rotating wing masks, masks the rigging is, is um, not drum tight because we have to allow for that rotation. And so typically the rigging is um, is tightened by with lashings and and not uh, typically not with uh, with rigging screws. So again, it's just very important to ensure that um, that we lock the T-ball fittings. And we can see two different methods here. One is uh, this kind of rubber plug that should be inserted. If you look at the picture on the on the left, the one is not present, but um, typically we would one would like to see that. Um, and then we can see the picture uh, at the top um, right. We can see there that there is a sort of more permanent type of lock, um, locking kind of bar applied to that um, T-ball fitting. Now, um, also the T-ball plates where they go into the, you know, in 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 where they are in the mast. Of course, they are a high load area, especially when you apply them to carbon fiber masts, and uh, and and really. Um, uh, visual as well as uh, non-destructive testing is 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 typical on especially on carbon fiber masts. On aluminium masts, you will be able to see if um, you know if if that area has been overloaded. Um, fastening fittings is um is is very important. Um, and um, typically the weak link is the strength of the attachment. Um, you know, and and the, and the kind of internal. Uh, fastener threads that are that are engaged. And and so when we find that you're using um threads cut you know by wood screws into wood or by sheet metal screws into fiberglass or into other or into aluminium masts um really lack the strength consistent durability that machine threads um inside a metal nut or other thick metal component can provide. So again I think when we do these inspections we need to start also looking at whether the appropriate type of fastener has been used. Bolts or machine screws must be used to secure components, um, which are essential to the boat function um, and could uh, could uh, pull or pry loose from, from the boat. Um, and again, of course, we can use, um, you know, we can use rivets uh, or machine screws are of course, on extruded aluminum spars are, are, are the best approach to, to attaching fittings. Now, um, and then in terms of sheet metal screws, um, you know, they should never be used to fasten hardware um, and because they're designed to be held in place really by a single thread. Um, and when fastening a hardware into extruded aluminum spars, we use machine screws, the only, um, only, practically, uh, only practical in applications when the wall thickness meets the following guidelines. Okay, so again, we need to to be cognizant of that. Machine screws must be a three one six grade stainless, um, and typically discoloration of the fastenings is often an indicator that um, the fastenings are actually of lower grade, uh, three or four stainless or similar. Um, and there's, uh, as I think, as we all know, there's a simple test that um, three or four stainless is slightly magnetic, whereas three one six is not. Um, in terms of uh, you know. Pop rivets, um, as we said, there is a, a lot of um, um, fittings are attached to aluminum spars using pop rivets. Um, we all kind of know how they how they work now. Um, and of course, there are different types. There's, you know, the dome head, the flanged heads and the countersunk heads. And we tend to see um, most typically for attaching fittings or sail tracks or things of that nature, we tend to see the dome head being used. Where spars are being uh, jointed um, in those areas to reduce the um, 
the actual um, you know wind resistance we uh, and and to provide a, a, a smoother surface we would typically see countersunk rivets being used um, now we of course have different uh, different types of of material that the rivets are made from um, and typically um, you know the typical choice is 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 a mono rivets um, uh, with stainless steel mandrels and um, obviously for very low load um, aspects um, you know you 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 could uh, you, you could use um, aluminium rivets but typically um, you would not uh, and then you can of course use stainless steel rivets as well but it's important that the that the that the mandrels which uh, you know so obviously as we pull them up the mandrel breaks off but there is still part of the mandrel inside the rivet. And um, that needs to also be a material that will not rust. So some, um, you know, as for example, you can get aluminum rivets with steel mandrels, which would be totally unacceptable because of the steel mandrel still remaining in the rivet uh, would of course rust. Then we can also see here on the picture on the um, right hand side that these rivet holes um, are filled with little plugs to make them watertight obviously to prevent uh, any water ingress into the into the spa itself and to uh, to prevent any um, moisture inside causing corrosion and these are, are um, little plastic plugs that you can actually tap in and then can then cut off flush with a um, uh, with a very sharp blade um, or otherwise um, the other option is just to fill the those holes with uh, with some epoxy um, glue to seal them um, there are also interestingly enough, they all have um, they have um, created pop rivets for use in carbon fiber laminates. Now, typically, uh, glass fiber carbon fiber laminates, um, you would typically you would well you would not typically you would not use a standard type of pop rivet because the fact that um, it overloads the surrounding area as you pull it up. And, and and actually causes damage to 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 the the, the area around the rivet hole. Um, so these particular rivets are done in such a way that they um, don't actually provide that much compressive force as you pull them up, and they also pull up to a much larger kind of ball uh, on the on the inside of of the um, on the inside surface. And uh, but again, they are not. They are only used for, you know, um, you know, fitting, um, you know, some smaller types of fittings, um, and and typically, you know, do things like you know tillers and um, tiller extensions, fittings to tillers and things like that. They are not typically used to um, attach any, um, you know, fittings of um, high load application to 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 carbon fiber masts. But just an interesting fact that the these things are available and have been derived, have been especially manufactured for for that type of approach. Here we can see actually countersunk machine screws used on a mast joint. Um, of course, countersunk rivets could also be used, but this is really to um, to reduce the um, you know the the drag. Um, you know, you you typically wouldn't want to use dome head rivets in this particular or or, or round head machine screws or um, in, in this particular application. Now, talking about safety, um, the term safety or safety wiring is used in marine aircraft and other industries. Um, so, you know, it's, it's securing by various means, um, you know, nuts, bolts, turnbuckles, and other mechanical fasteners or pins so that vibration does not cause it to loosen in operation. So a very interesting um, point was made by... Um, by Kim here that um, anything on a boat can unscrew itself. Um, you know, the, um, and, and, and in fact that, you know, there, there is extreme vibration in boats and uh, we need to really uh, ensure that we safety, um, that we safety everything um, to ensure that um, we don't have um, any catastrophic failures due to, um, you know, to, to fastness coming loose, um, things of that nature. Um, so again, there, there, there are certain rules and guidelines here for um, split spin size and usage. Um, and um, I, I've, you know, and 
we know sometimes we we see split pins and they're kind of um, bent. They're much too long and they're fully bent around um, the actual pin itself, coming right back um, up towards the um, uh, that the kind of head of the pin uh, and things like that, which is not uh, not good practice. And again, the um, the importance of um, of really taping um, uh, split rings and pins to ensure that um, that they don't um, they don't they don't get hooked on things or um, can injure crew members, etc. Um, again, split pins. Um, uh, some people feel they they that you can and should re reuse split pins. Um, you know, these are very cheap items, um, and you know. To, to be really safe, it's 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 much better and uh, probably um, better practice just to to replace the split pins and use new ones when you um, when you re-rig. Um, again, I'm in terms of safety of synthetic rigging. Um, you know, typically we use uh, we use lashings which are tied off. Again, these must be these must be taped. Um, to prevent the knots from really coming undone, because um, you know typically the synthetic um, rope uh, rope rigging doesn't doesn't hold a knot very well because it's very slippery material. Okay, the the spectra or dyneema that it's made of um, is naturally very is naturally very slippery, um, and so they, they 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 must be taped to ensure that the uh, that the knots don't work loose. Um, and they, and then of course they must be retaped at regular intervals. You know, critical lashings include, of course, lifeline lashings, standing rigging lashings, as we said, which are, which are, are are often used for things like rotating masts, where we're not actually using um, turnbuckles. And here is actually a a bowsprit bobstay um, lashing um, on a. Um, on, on a um, racing trimaran, but of course remember that when we're underway, there's a lot of water, uh, you know, lapping up the bow here, which would again uh, tend to to disturb, potentially disturb this lashing. Um, and remember, any one of these um, lashing knots coming loose, you know, could result in in a total rig failure, um, in 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 many cases. Uh, lock nuts, lock nuts, very. Um, you know, um, again, a safety aspect. Um, what we're indicating here is that uh, we can see a picture here of a boom, and it's got a uh, um, you know standard uh, nut on it, which is working loose. This was just a random picture taken um, in a marina, and a, a closer um, inspection actually, um, uh, you know, yielded this um, this situation, which is uh, kind of interesting. Now. We know that nylon nuts, as we can you know, see, have this nylon collar, and that provides friction, which prevents them from um, actually um, vibrating loose or, 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 or loosening. Um, certain authorities disagree uh, with respect to um, whether they can be reused or not. Um, I think we can also look at, we should always look also at other industries because, or, or other, um, other aspects, and often we can be we can be well guided, of course, also by the uh, by aviation. And in fact, um, it was a really tragic accident that happened um, at the Reno Air Races in Reno, Nevada, uh, when there was this the, the um, this um, P fifty one Mustang Galloping Ghost actually crashed, and um, you know, ten people on the pilot and ten people on the ground were killed. And this was all related back to um, some some nylock nuts that, that have been reused and then cause the trim tab to to become loose and then wear its mounts and then um, it parted in flight and, and this and this this occurred. Now, you know, these things are really tragic because this is a, a you know a couple of you know you know a few dollars um, to replace these nylocks and 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 a kind of such a catastrophic result. And so I think um, you know my recommendation is they're not costly. So just uh, don't take any chances and 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 replace um, replace nylocks um, every time you you after your removal um, replace them with new nylock nuts. Uh, safety wiring and mousing, you know this we probably are familiar with, um, where we use wire to actually wire up 
thing, fittings like shackles to prevent them from vibrating loose. Um, again, um, it's fairly typical. We need to check for this um, and to see that this is, has been done um, on the rigs. Um, a lot of people are, you know, kind of um, saying, you know, using nylon cable ties or what we might call zip ties to do the same thing. They pass the zip tie around the kind of body of the shackle and then through the pin and then tighten it up. But again, you know, UV light breaks down the cable ties over time. And and so cable ties are not acceptable for critical components. And and, and we just need to um I think, you know, stamp out that 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 kind of practice. I mean, it it might be it it's it's quick, but it's kind of quick and dirty approach and, and uh, has no place. You know, obviously other industries like aviation are very, very um specific in terms of, of, of safety wiring. And safety wiring is typically done with a um with stainless it's just stainless steel wire that you use. And then of course you would tape over it to prevent this um the wire tail, of course, um being a hazard. Now I'm not going to do a lot on corrosion. I just want to talk a little bit about um dislimum of metals, especially with respect to carbon fiber. Um and we know that the um the distance between um, the materials is is um, what is an indicator of um, how much potential there is for um, for, for corrosion um, if you combine the two materials. What we're seeing is really that um, you know so typically uh, we know on um, aluminium masks we typically use um, stainless steel here, so they they're relatively close together. Um, we're seeing increasingly now that on carbon fiber masks, we, we can use stainless steel, but a lot of uh, manufacturers are, are, are fittings are producing, um, you know, titanium um, uh, fittings. So, you know, these titanium bushes, for example, from Allen Brothers fittings in the UK are actually not that expensive and, and would be something that you would use typically on carbon fiber masks for, you know, attachment of the, of the rigging through to, um, you know, and, and, and the synthetic rigging would run through these and then be attached internally, et cetera. Um, you can, of course, insulate, um, you know, these types of uh, bushes and things, um, you know, by using, um, in certain areas, you can introduce, um, you can introduce fiberglass, um, obviously on the, on the surfaces of the carbon fiber, but also you can uh, use epoxy around these fittings to kind of insulate the two materials using um, epoxy uh, glues to do that. But, um, you know, they, but, but if you can um, use, use a uh, titanium or, um, then of course it's, um, it, it, it is, it is better. Now, one of the other things that um, we've seen written quite a, written up quite a lot is that people are saying, well, if you want to, um, insulate um the you know a, a winch from a um aluminum spa then put a uh, put a piece of plastic from a um you know coffee tin you know plastic coffee tin lid or something cut it to shape put it underneath now again this is extremely bad practice and um again we need to you know inherit from the aviation industry what happened there was that instead of using um traditional gaskets, they started using um, these, um, you know, silicon gasket materials and um, high temperature um, silicon gaskets. Now, these gaskets formed with, with those materials are actually soft. So you actually find that the two surfaces move on each other all the time when they come under load. And what it does actually is it's introducing a shear force into the bolts that are now holding that or, or the fastenings that are now holding that particular uh, fitting onto um, onto the spar itself, which is again um, not something that you want to be introducing because that they are then going to get potentially a shear failure um, on on those those um, those those fastenings because if you actually attach it directly and you bolt it or fasten it hard down onto the surface, you you don't get any flexibility at that joint and therefore you don't get any shear forces introduced unnecessarily. Um, again, a, gal a galvanic corrosion in Mars, we talk about, we spoke about that. Um, 
you know, and, and this is kind of indications of, of, of how and where we might see it. It's kind of this, you see this kind of powdering and effect, or you see the paint, uh, you know, actually flaking off because corrosion has occurred beneath it. Um, again, um, we find that, um, you know, aluminum masks are, are often painted because the typical um, approach there is you either anodize, um, but a lot of anodizing tanks are not big enough to take uh, very long spars. So then the next thing to do is to to actually paint those spars. And then you tend to find that, um, um, you know, moisture will find its way in behind the, the paint, especially where, you uh, know, once drilled for fastenings and things like that. And and then of course the um, corrosion starts um, and, and then um, needs to be, uh, you know, carefully inspected to see to what degree uh, that's, that has occurred. And then actually to, to actually repaint that area and make sure that it is, um, the, the, that the corrosion will not continue. Um, corrosion prevention, um, typically the tried and tested thing is to put zinc chromate behind different types of fittings. Um, and uh, that, that's a tried and tested approach. Um, but again, um, very important to, to look at the safety data sheet on um, these kind of compounds. Uh, holes in spars, um, we tend to find that, um, you know, we need to check the fact that, uh, you know, any holes in spars have uh, well radius corners. Uh, avoid multiple holes in the horizontal plane and avoid square corners, of course. And over here, you can see there is a uh, cutout in a to lighten a boom, and you can see on the right hand side there that um, it has a very good uh, a good radius on the um, on the end of the the cutout. Um, protective finishes just very quickly, um, and um, we've spoken here about. Um, you know, we know about wooden spars are coated with uh, in deputy varnishes with UV inhibitors. And I mean, the spars we've spoken about, carbon fiber spars, we need to um, understand that, um, you know, these can can either be protected by using pigment in the epoxy for the layout of the, uh, of, of the outer layers. You can use a clear varnish or paint to provide extra UV protection. There are also certain epoxy resins that have um, a UV inhibitor. One of them is the is is one of the waste system resins, but equally uh, you've got to be careful because if you're uh, depending on how the manufacturing technique of your spa, remember that that um, natively carbon fiber spas are black, and so they will actually you know um, you know experience a lot of heating uh, from the sun, and there is something in um, called the glass transition temperature at which depending on the resin type that you're using, you can get very close to the temperature where the resin starts to uh, to not be um, rigid anymore. Uh, it starts to become more flexible. Um, and this is, as this has been a factor in um, composite um, aircraft uh, that are typically only painted a white color. Obviously, um, it is more, th this problem is more prevalent in horizontal surfaces and typically mass of vertical surfaces. So, um, but again, it, it's not something, it's something that we could look at. Um, resources available from IMS, um, there is, as always, as I think we said earlier in these presentations, there's always um, really good information available from IMS. There's an article, um, it was in the report by from Kim, um, very, very uh, good article there. Um, and then there's, um, there's some, some additional handy guides that um, are, are being produced. So um, we can do some questions and answers um, quickly, or um, we can just go on to the um, AI and then take all of them at the end. Um, Mike, what do you think is more appropriate? Well, let, let's let's put it out to the audience. Has anybody got any yeah. questions they would like to raise at this stage on rigs and masks? And uh, thank you, Nick, for sharing uh, your extensive knowledge, and, and thank you for all the publishing you've done. Any any questions at this stage? Thank you. In which case, uh, what I'm going to do, Nick, let, let, I'm going to turn this into two presentations. So I'm just going to stop the recording.